Healthcare is changing, and Dr. Nancy R.N. is here for you. The topics are many, but each program stands on its own with three key action points for you to learn. Your guide to a healthier you in a changing world. Dr. Nancy R.N. Welcome to Dr. Nancy RN, Healthy You, Healthy Nation, Healthy World. I'm Nancy Valentine. I am a PhD and a registered nurse, and this show is dedicated to you, the healthcare consumer. And part of our mission is to bring to your attention all kinds of interesting things in healthcare so that you will be able to navigate the healthcare system more effectively and have a better understanding of how to take care of yourself. And part of taking care of yourself is really understanding some of the roles and responsibilities of some of the people that you may meet in the healthcare system. And today we have a fascinating guest with us. We have Mary Walton from the University of Pennsylvania. And I want to give you some background on her because she is a nurse ethicist. And I'm sure that many of you have never even met a nurse ethicist or, or heard of a nurse ethicist. And she's going to tell us about her exciting role. Mary's background is one where she started as a bachelor degree nurse and got a master's degree from the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing and then got a second master's in bioethics. She has a certificate uh, in clinical ethics mediation from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. So I would like to welcome um, Mary Walton uh, to our show today because I think that the fascinating world of the nurse ethicist is something she's going to let us in on. Welcome, Mary. Thank you. Thanks for being with us. Now, Mary, the first question I would have is, um, how did you become a nurse ethicist? How did you get involved in mm -hmm. nursing ethics? You know, and then through that, you'll tell us a little bit about what is nursing mm -hmm. ethics. I'm happy to do that. Um, it's been a really a wonderful career. I was um, an advanced practice nurse working with children who had pretty significant chronic lung problems and their families. Um, and in that role, I got interested in some of the difficult uh, situations that arose. The two things that I think about that changed in practice were working with children who had cystic fibrosis. And working with them, uh, genetic testing became available for their parents and for them. And organ transplant, lung transplant became available. And I'm talking about sort of the mid-1980s, late 1980s. Mm -hmm. And we really struggled, we, when I say we, the physicians and nurses, about how to work with families. What was the right thing to do in terms of introducing mm -hmm. these new options? Um, should I have genetic testing? Do I want to find out if I'm a carrier? Do I want to find out if this pregnancy is going to also have a child who might be affected with cystic fibrosis? Transplantation was a, a very big um, concern. In the early years, you would have to travel. The outcomes for children who would have a lung transplant were not that good. So we agonized. Should we be presenting it? Should we be encouraging it? Should we be discouraging it? So the question's about what's the right thing to do and, and why would it be the right mm -hmm. thing to do? Should we be um, should we make decisions? Should we be neutral? And so I really got interested in exploring and learning um, how do we sort through these difficult problems? Um, and really got interested. I asked to be on the ethics committee. Hospitals mm -hmm. have had ethics committees for um, many years. And by getting on the committee, I learned even more about all the problems and issues that arise in this complex healthcare arena that we work in. Fascinating. Now, as a nurse, uh, and you got on the, on the ethics committee, was this an interdisciplinary committee? Mm -hmm. Was it more physician dominated? Mm -hmm. You know, when you started in the 80s with this, yes. what was sort of the, the temperature of the organization yes, at that the, point? The early years of ethics committees um, were primarily physicians, nurses, chaplains, and social workers mm -hmm. getting together and, and helping in hospitals sort through some of the uh, complex problems that arise in care. So from the very beginning, nurses were involved in that work. Mm -hmm. And as the field um, evolved, um, it was recognized. We got practice. We started doing what's called ethics consultation. So if someone had a question, whether it was a physician, a nurse, a patient, or a family member, or a conflict over what's the right thing to do. Um, physician recommends surgery, a patient rejects it, or two members of the clinical team have a difference of opinion about what's the right thing to do. Uh, we would respond to that, and that was called ethics consultation. Mm -hmm. So we started doing that work, learning, talking with each other. So very um, interprofessional in nature, um, sorting through that. And realizing over the years that I needed more knowledge 
as well as master's programs started to be developed around um, bioethics, mm -hmm. uh, it's, which is generally a, a young field if you think of it in terms of um, today, the advances in technology and all the questions and problems that brings forward. Mm -hmm. So I knew I needed to continue to develop and learn and I went and got a master's in bioethics, um, which was a wonderful experience and um, learning more whether, it, you know, in some ways bioethics is applied philosophy. You know, we always struggle with what's the meaning of being human? What's the right thing to do? Who gets to decide when there's a difference of opinion? Um, certainly many of the viewers may think about when a family member has um, debated, should I have aggressive surgery? Mm -hmm. Should I take the risks? Um, if you've ever been involved in a loved one who's on uh, aggressive end-of-life care, you know, how hard do you push? Uh, when is it time to stop? Is there ever a time to stop? Um, those kinds of um, questions are, are hard to sort through, and that's the kind of thing that ethics consultation work can offer to patients and families and clinicians in hospital settings. Yeah. So by doing that work, it really, again, just deepened my, um, my understanding as well as what I don't understand and knowing about um, sorting mm -hmm. through ethical con complex and problems. So as, as the healthcare field was evolving itself, becoming much more technologically driven, mm -hmm. then the choices became much more uh, complex. Right. It sounds like your career evolved as well by right. going in this direction. Yeah. I mean, I've always worked in academic healthcare settings where the complexity of treatment options is overwhelming sometimes for clinicians. I mean, we sit and struggle about what are all the options that should be put on the table to think about for a particular patient. I mean, the advances in our knowledge, skill, uh, along with technology, it's amazing what we've been able to mm -hmm. change in terms of the health of, of an individual. Um, so again, that has driven some of the, the questions that arise. Right. I mean, the early years of bioethics started with um, kidney transplant, uh, kidney dialysis. So when kidney dialysis first became available, there were limited uh, number of dialysis machines. And so how do you decide who should get the limited resource? Right. And um, you know, thinking about these tough questions that we struggle with um, in healthcare. That is, that is very challenging. In terms of your your day to day role, what would a nurse ethicist you know typically do mm -hmm. when you arrive at work uh, mm -hmm. or over the course mm -hmm. of a week? What kinds of you know problems do you touch? People mm -hmm. do you touch? Mm -hmm. What's it like? Mm -hmm. So uh, the areas that I work in, I do a lot of teaching, and sometimes it's formal teaching in a classroom, and sometimes it's informal on a unit when mm -hmm. um, someone calls with a question. So we do a lot of talking about what are all the things that should be considered. Um, ethics consultation, um, that is definitely a part of my practice. Um, any hospital that's joint commission accredited, um, it requires that you have a process for staff to get help, staff, patients, and families to get help. So we, off we, carry, we have a pager for ethics, and I carry that pager. Um, we um, cover that 24-7. Uh, last Saturday night, a physician called in the evening with a particular perplexing problem um, that uh, I help sort through, often by asking a lot of questions um, and, again, informing, bringing a process forward to think through how we might approach this problem mm -hmm. and what other information do we need. So ethics consultation, responding to specific requests um, is part of that. We do a lot of policy work. Um, and that really comes from being, I co-chair the ethics committee at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. My co-chair is a physician, Dr. Kim Overby, who also has, in addition to her medical degree, has a master's mm -hmm. in bioethics. Mm -hmm. And together we lead the work of that committee. Um, and again, that involves ethics consultation, uh, education of staff, um, and policy development. Mm -hmm. The best example of policy development in Pennsylvania um, Pretty recently, we had a new law around healthcare decision making. Oh, tell us about that. Yeah, so Act 169 uh, is Pennsylvania law, and that really was developed to give um, assistance in sorting through healthcare decisions, which often can be problematic. Um, sometimes um, patients can't speak for themselves, and if they may have appointed someone to be their representative, but sometimes patients haven't, or sometimes there's patients who have no one. Um, we call that the underrepresented or unbefriended. And so um, making, how do we make decisions for a patient who's not able to speak for themselves and has no loved one? So we um, 
have policies at the hospital that guide our physicians and nurses and social workers in, you know, how do we handle these? Mm -hmm. Because often there are significant decisions that need to be made, whether it's about an aggressive surgery, another round of chemotherapy, um, how long do we uh, extend life with some of the technology that can do that. Um, and in Pennsylvania, we'd be very careful. That's not a decision for a physician or nurse to make. It's a decision for a patient. But if a patient can't, voice isn't there for whatever reason, how do we sort through that? So Pennsylvania law is very um, prescriptive, and we had to really understand that at the hospital. So that was policy work that um, I spent a great deal, uh, actually it was over a year where I worked with many of the lawyers and others on the ethics committee to understand the law and then embed it in our policies. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. So really translating it. Absolutely. For day-to-day -day right, utilization. Right. And we still get questions because sometimes the law would say that a group of people need to make a decision for a patient who cannot. And so sometimes those loved ones have a difference of opinion. I can think right. of consults where the family has said, we'd like an ethics consult because we're really agonizing over what to do. Interesting. And we don't, you know, there's a couple options on the table. Mm -hmm. um, and we want help with that. Right. So we, so as an ethicist, we can bring forward a process. We don't bring forward authority to tell you what to do, but we can ask a lot of questions, help you think about. Um, one, of, one of the things I often say to families who are struggling with this is, you know, if your mother or brother were sitting here and could talk to us, tell me about them. What would they want? Mm -hmm. Did they ever talk about this before? Do they ever talk about some of the cases who are in the news? Sometimes finding out, depending on your age, whether it was Karen Ann Quinlan or Terry Shivo, did they talk about that? Um, was there ever another family member or neighbor who was in a situation like this? What did they say? What did they think was right? So you're trying to help the family bring the voice of the patient and the patient's values and preferences forward. So the burden really isn't on the family to decide, you know, my brother would want this or my mother would want that. Mm -hmm. It's, it, you know, you're helping them speak for them rather than deciding this is what you want to happen. Interesting, interesting. So that takes the ability to not only understand the issues, but to really be able to be a great listener and right. listen to everybody's right. input. Right. And at the same time, not be an arbitrator, but again, right. a facilitator. Absolutely. Help people to right. come to their right. own decisions. I've gotten a lot of feedback, which is always so rewarding with sometimes with consults. I can remember one of our critical care physicians. I followed up a couple days later after a consult, and he said, you know, we were all talking. All you did was ask us questions. But again, bringing another um, person into the group that's struggling with some tough decisions and say, tell me more about that. What is the prognosis? What is the range? You know, for, for families, sometimes hearing there's a chance, um, is a chance 50-50? There's a chance one in a million. Have you ever seen a patient like this survive? Um, you know, the family saying, well, I, I thought there was a reasonable hope. Uh, so press on, press on. Uh, and the team may think, you know, we're really causing a lot of suffering, and we don't know if this patient is ever going to wake up or ever come, right. come out of our right. ICU. Um, or sometimes things look grim, and if we've had families say, I think it's time to stop, and the team would say, I think there's hope. And so asking questions and bringing information forward and getting the group together. Mm -hmm. And the right, um, we call them the stakeholders. Who cares about this? Mm -hmm. So it's very important to have the, the medical team there. It's very important to have the nurses. The bedside nurse who's um, in that room with that patient has an understanding of over 8 or 12 hours. You know, what is going on? Do we think the patient's suffering? Is the patient um, asking questions that the family doesn't understand or the physicians or other members of the team haven't had the luxury of being there providing care mm -hmm. um, and can bring that information forward. So it's, it's asking questions, pulling out information, and really, again, bringing a process. And then when everything's on the table, um, you know, sorting through who gets to decide. And sometimes that is a legal question mm -hmm. rather than an ethical question. But the ethical process is bringing forward all the values and perspectives and preferences that are relevant to the issue. I think what I hear uh, Mary describing for us as, as listeners, people who have not been, you know, in such roles, is that in the pressure of a healthcare si system and, and decision making, people often feel pressed to make the decision rapidly, you know, mm -hmm. under, under time constraints. Um, 
whatever. And I hear her telling us that we really should take that step back, mm -hmm. even if we need somebody to help us, to, to guide us to take that step back. Mm -hmm. And then the second I hear is that you really have to listen to mm -hmm. everyone's input. Mm -hmm. And everyone's input is critical mm -hmm. in order to have alignment between, <coughs> excuse me, particularly the treatment team and the family or the significant mm -hmm. others, you know, that right. are involved in this right. case. These are important points. One, um, the first point you made in terms of um, slowing the process down, an ethicist actually from Canada, I heard was presented probably 15 years ago at an ethics consult, but we've used it and quoted it. And that is often what an ethics consult is about. Let's slow this down. Many times decisions don't need to be made in the immediate moment. And in that case, you know, people mm -hmm. use their very best judgment. But let's just slow down. What else don't we know? What's what's more to the story mm -hmm. um, that is relevant and important? And, and let's take time to do this in a thoughtful way. Mm -hmm. um, and again, bring forward the perspective. Have you seen examples where people, when they carefully listen to one another, really do change their yes. opinions? Yes. Well, oftentimes when the, the consultation page will go off, um, for example, a nurse or a physician might present you know, we have recommended something that we know will benefit this patient. We've been very clear, and the patient refuses our recommendation. So one of my questions is, you know, why, why do they refuse? Why do they think this isn't what will benefit them? And sometimes I get silence, because we're so invested in, we care so much, we have the knowledge, we have the experience. So we're always pushing out, this is why we think it's important. Mm -hmm. This is why we think this is the best medical advice. And so that is often one of the first things, well, because, well, why do they um, reject what's recommended? So when I go in and talk to a patient, it's like, tell me more about it. What do you understand from what the physicians and nurses have been explaining? Mm -hmm. Why do you think that won't solve your problem or not, that's not in your best interest? And it's fascinating. I mean, that is fascinating because, you know, everyone has a different experience and so when you get information you you hear it in different ways if I've had a family member who was in a coma and woke up that's my framework so when when you tell me someone's not going to wake up I'm like well I know something different um, so getting the patient's perspective learning about their experience what did you hear um, and often that can really sort things out right there mm -hmm. because the the physicians or nurses don't understand how the patients um, seeing the issue uh, because they've been so invested in teaching and encouraging uh, for what we believe is best mm -hmm. and uh, patients have a different view about that or family members have right a different now view. I know that um, you know with all the different cases there would be you know many different scenarios mm -hmm. but do you see any themes you know coming forward you know when you do have those consultations and people do listen more carefully to one mm -hmm. another what what would you say are some of the common takeaways I think one is understanding the complexity of the options on the table. That oftentimes physicians or nurses won't appreciate how the patient views this. Um, and then for patients, I didn't really understand that. I heard the words and I could maybe repeat them back, but I didn't understand them in terms of my life. So in terms of whatever the, uh, the medical or nursing mm -hmm. staff are saying mm -hmm. in terms of, of their passion, for mm -hmm. instance, of why they want a particular treatment to continue right. or something new to come right. into the equation, um, the person that they're talking to may be shaking their head yes or no, right. or but they really are telling you mm -hmm. that they really have no concept necessarily right. of what, right. that really right. what that really means. Yeah. So it's a communication right. Right. gap. Well, a very different concept um, of it, even though they've heard the words. And that's why it's so important for clinicians to say tell me how you understand this you know five different people over the last week have explained this treatment regimen but now it would help me for you to explain what do you mm -hmm. think it is what do you mm -hmm. think it'll do for you the other um, issue is we all have ideas about what's a quality of life that we think is acceptable so for some people being independent is incredibly valuable I would you know so when I hear something that's going to limit my independence whether it's temporary or permanently I might react to it very differently than someone else who doesn't have that value. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so, again, seeing that difference mm -hmm. um, and understanding the meaning of that for the decisions that are on the table right. is really important. So clearly there's no black and white in these equations. No. No. Absolutely. Now, being a nurse ethicist, you obviously deal with the nursing staff a lot. What, what kind of issues do you help the nurses who are at the bedside mm -hmm. who really are right 
in the middle mm -hmm. of a, a lot of yes. these uh, conflicts. Yes. Um, what kind of conflicts do they experience themselves? Uh, how, do, how do you work with them? What yeah. do you do? Well, one of the things that we um, understand is a phenomenon that's true for nursing and it, we're also understanding it affects other people as well, something we call moral distress. And that's when I think I'm very clear about what's right and something's preventing me from doing that. Um, and I, sort of the, I think the example that might illustrate this best is thinking about pain. So nurses, for example, in our, we have a value about managing pain. We, we think it's important to offer, whether it's a pharmacologic management of pain or positioning comfort measures, um, having a loved one with you. But treating your pain and being responsive, that is really important value in nursing. Right, because it would be all part of the care and comfort equation. Absolutely. You know, something that we feel like right. we really bring to that right. equation. And that's one of our values as nurses, right. as a profession. But there are different values about that. Um, and for example, a, a, a nurse might be with a patient who's really having significant pain. And maybe a physician disagrees. I don't I don't want to give this drug for whatever reason. Um, I'm worried about side effects or, or um, preservation of something else that's going on physiologically right then, so I'd really like to minimize the mm -hmm. pain mm -hmm. drugs. Um, sometimes family members say, I don't want you to give them too much pain. I want them to be alert and oriented. Um, sometimes patients or families will say, pain's not such a bad thing. Pain can be redemptive. I've met with families who say, suffering is a part of life. Um, it has meaning in the afterlife. So there's all different values and understandings about pain. And so um, I can know pharmacists have worried about this is too whopping a dose of, of a drug. I don't want to dispense it upstairs. And so we've had pharmacists in my career mm -hmm. say, I, I really question this order. What are you doing? This is too much drug. Um, so um, thinking about those values and whose values get to um, call the shot, so to speak, in terms of managing pain. Um, so talking with nurses about that, finding out what patients and family members want, and working through that. But we, we know um, talking about it and inviting other perspectives. So in terms of small group discussions on inpatient units when nurses are struggling mm -hmm. about um, a patient suffering, because they're in that room taking care of the patient for hours and hours and sometimes days and weeks on end, right. um, they can really be struggling with, I want to manage this pain differently, uh, or I think um, this treatment course is causing too much suffering. Mm -hmm. And so I feel um, being part of that is troublesome to me. And we want people to pay attention. If you, you know, something doesn't feel right, um, let's explore right, what right, other information. Right. So you, really you do want the staff, nurses and others to speak up. Yes, we want so to you pay invite attention. that dialogue. Right. And inviting it, one of the important things with ethical issues, if I raise an ethical concern, it shouldn't imply that I think you're doing something unethical. It means I want to bring the concern forward. Let's talk about it. What, what other information do I need? How can I um, sort this through? Whether it's talking, getting other perspectives, sometimes reading the ethics literature, I've had nurses say, I was so troubled by this, I had no idea that other people nationally have been troubled by this. Right and reading about it, talking about it, um, and getting support. Or sometimes, again, bringing a group together and, um, and let's sorting through um, who, whose values right. um, get to be the ones that determine the plan. Well, I think that what service you're providing is not only you know, the, the nuts and bolts of how to make a decision around a particular patient or that kind mm -hmm. of a dilemma, but I think you're also helping the staff. Nurses, you know, again, mm -hmm. really get hit with a brunt of some of this because they are, as you mentioned, there mm -hmm. over the longer period of time. Uh, but everyone really plays a role mm -hmm. in dealing with their own stress about mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. because that kind of uh, dilemma can be extremely stressful mm -hmm. and even potentially alienating mm -hmm. in terms of your job satisfaction right, right. or your ability to even sustain your role in right. some of these settings. Right. Have you have you dealt with people like that? Yeah, I think the proximity to suffering has a moral burden is sort of one of the things we say. So if you have a critically ill patient where maybe we don't know if this patient's going to survive or ever be responsive or out of the ICU. You. There's a burden for that nurse. Mm -hmm. um, and nurses spend hours and hours in that care. But that suffering or what worries that nurse might not be visible to the family and it might not be visible to our physician colleagues. So um, talking about bringing that forward is important. I talk to nurses say, do you think the family, you know, a family that's saying, I want you to continue with aggressive care no matter how 
a slight the, the chance of recovery is. So what do we do? We make patients look very comfortable. Um, we prepare them. We don't necessarily show some of the suffering that um, a patient might go through or what's troubling a nurse. So we, we talk about how do you engage them? Do they understand um, what you're troubled by? Also for our physician colleagues who are in and out of the room in brief time periods, uh, they might not have a perspective on certain treatments are causing um, physical suffering for a patient. Right. And so right. I've had many, many consults where we bring people together where the nurse can say, this is what's troubling me. And we've been able to change the treatment plan or family members have said, oh, I had no idea. You know, I didn't, I thought they were comfortable. You know, I, I didn't realize that people think there's a, a great burden for continuing with this care. And maybe we want to factor that in. It might not change the plan, but if everybody can understand the other perspectives and the really the moral concerns. I mean, I think that is really important that um, a nurse understand why a family is continuing with aggressive care or why a patient wants to. Um, or a physician knows, can we talk about this treatment plan? This one particular thing causes um, physical pain. Every time we do this, every four hours, it takes me 20 or 30 minutes to get the patient comfortable again. That might be invisible to the right. patient. I think, I think in many cases it is. So yeah. what you're saying, and, and again, another theme through all this is really making the invisible visible, you mm -hmm. know, really lending a whole level of transparency yes. to the whole care process. Because I certainly can identify that having made rounds in, in intensive care units and you see some of these patients are hooked up to so many different um, mm -hmm. apparatus, tubes, mm -hmm. y you, you name it. Mm -hmm. and, and yet they look angelic practically yes. lying there. And, yeah. and you wonder, mm -hmm. just walking through, mm -hmm. how much is really going on or really what would be any chance of mm -hmm. this person making a mm -hmm. recovery. Right. And one thing I would want viewers to know is that they can ask for an ethics consult. Um, I've had many family members uh, call a consult um, and say, you know, I, I don't know, should we continue? You know, mm -hmm. particularly if a patient's not able to participate. And occasionally patients ask for, I'd like sort of an ethical analysis or review. I'm troubled by the options. Or, and, and it is a resource mm -hmm. for folks. And it's a good thing to raise these questions. It, it isn't implying that anyone's doing anything wrong. I think, again, this issue of transparency. We all care. We all want what's right. But we may have a difference of opinion or different information that's informing our opinion. Right. I think that's really a critical um, uh, takeaway from this. And that is, if you say, I want an ethics concept consult, or you just even want to think about the concepts embedded mm -hmm. in in ethics, it's not implying that someone isn't doing their job right. or that the family is not f uh, having the compassion that they mm -hmm. might for their, for their mm -hmm. loved one. It's really just raising the question, raising the issue. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's a really important mm -hmm. point. Now, how would someone go about doing that? Do they have to go through their doctor to, to ask for a consult? How, how does any, in the, how in the inpatient do setting, they could tell their doctor, they could tell the nurse. Um, I'd like an ethics consult right. and anybody uh, certainly at the hospital University of Pennsylvania would know how to make that happen And I think really in any hospital that's um, a joint commission Accredited hospital would have a process for an ethics consultation um, And think of it as using your resources and getting help when you think about the complexity of healthcare decision-making as well as the diversity of values you know how you and I see the world might be pretty different, even right. though we're both nurses right. and both women. Right. These, this presents a difference. And how can we get help with some of these? Do we go for aggressive surgery? Do we go for the research-based protocol? Um, how aggressive should we be? Um, what are the risk benefits from, from certain uh, options on the table? When you're at a place like Penn, there are so many options and it's so complex. I mean, we have difference of opinions in our clinical teams about should we do A right. or B? Right. And, and there's pros and cons right. to each. And so for a patient and a family to sort through that and figure out what's the right thing to do and, and how would I justify that? In closing, tell me about what the rewards are for your job. Oh, well, I, well, I love being a nurse and being a nurse to me is working with patients and families. So I'm always edified with um, how families care for each other through this complexity of healthcare crises. Um, it's always very rewarding to talk and know that um, you're helping them and you're, you're understanding their world. They teach me something. Every consult I learn something new about a patient or family's experience. 
um, as well as our physicians and nurses, that we care so much and we want to do the right thing. And um, being part of that process and helping people is incredibly rewarding. So it's, it's interesting, it's intellectually challenging, but you do have the opportunity to feel you make a difference. Um, I, I once had a family member come back and find me and want me to meet some other family members. And she had actually asked for a consult related to um, a family member's care. And that was so rewarding that, you know, days later she could come back and say it was so helpful working this through with you and, and I feel better about where we're going as a family. That's wonderful. Well, I want to thank Mary Walton mm -hmm. for her um, education of us today because I think that I've learned a lot about what her role entails and how she works with the team. But I think more importantly for all of us, we know that we have equal access to such services if and when we need them. And I hope that that will be something that we don't necessarily have to, to confront, but if so, we know that that is available and that there are people like Mary, God <laughs> bless her, who are out there doing that really hard work of translating. Thank you very much for being with us today. I hope you enjoyed our conversation today and that the information will help you in meeting your health goals. Catch this program and other conversations on the website, drnancyrn.com. Or you can write to me as well. I welcome your comments and feedback. Thank you for listening and join us again. And remember, with health, all things are possible.